looking for the king of podcasts, you're at the wrong channel. Looking for good ideas for life, you are far from good hands. If you think the listener is always right, you are far from the right place. Hosted by a Northeasterner by birth, a rebel by choice. If you want a host that floats between love and madness, then play on and listen to Crazy Train Radio. What up? Excuse me while I whip this out. Oh, gnarly! Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. I double dare you, motherfucker. Say what one more goddamn time. I'm surrounded by assholes. And good evening, friends. With over 30 years of experience and a superb reputation for being a detail-oriented company, Lacey Cleaning has some of the highest work standards in the cleaning business. That's the fact! Whether it's carpet cleaning, tile, grout cleaning, new construction cleanup, rental turnovers, vent and duct cleaning, odor elimination, office and or business cleaning, power washing, residential cleaning, you name it, they do it. (coughs) Check them out. To contact them today, LaceyCleaning at gmail.com or call them at 609-709-8536. That's what I'm talking about. Not all football helmets are created equal. Zenith, the industry leader in protective technology, is the only helmet in the game with adaptive head protection featuring a shock suspension system that can move independently from the helmet shell. Headquartered and developed in Detroit, Zenith is committed to player safety and revolutionary innovation. Zenith is proud to protect athletes at every level from peewee to the pros. Learn more about the Zenith difference at zenith.com. That's X-E-N-I-T-H dot com. Hey, this is Margot Ray, and you're listening to Crazy Train Radio. Survivor. 
Yeah. So how are you doing health wise overall? You know, I'm I'm pretty uh I'm very diligent about my commitment to my permanent remission, you know. I think it's yes. uh something you just incorporate into your lifestyle and I was already healthy when it happened, but uh you know, sometimes things just just happen. Uh the yeah. world is a toxic place and stress turns into inflammation and inflammation turns into disease. So keep those stress levels down, people. Um I like to call it cancer warrior actually. And it's a yeah, it's yeah. a cause near and dear to me. But thanks for asking. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I try to I help understand. people through it, you know. Yes, uh, survivor myself. On a oh, sense. wow! Congratulations. I, I know. I uh, know you. For, well, from what I understand, you were always one to eat, exercise regularly, eat organically, and all that fun stuff to help as well. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, like to, yeah. Well, you know, try to like you said with the potential toxins out there. It's always try to. It's always good to try to compact with positive influences. Yeah, I think in many ways it was, I think in many ways it was my inability in previous years to cope with stress. And so I internalized a lot of things and that turns into inflammation. You know, when you're like, oh, I can handle it, I can handle it, and you have too much on your plate and you don't. My question uh, for you would be with that, as far as that goes, uh, did you notice something was up, or did, was this a surprise, just like with an annual physical and all that fun stuff? I was one month away from my uh, annual checkup, my mammogram, and the lump was discovered one month prior to the annual checkup. And I was pretty diligent, but it just kind of surfaced. Uh, and good thing it did because it was early, caught it early. Yeah. And then in hindsight, you know, because you fill out all these questionnaires, as you know, you know, have you had a rapid weight loss, weight, rapid weight gain, this and that, you know. And and I pretty much answered no to a lot of those questions. And then in hindsight, I thought, yeah, well, there was that one thing when I was feeling, yeah, well, maybe that was it. And and you know I'm pretty athletic, and uh, I did notice that out of the blue, uh, you know, going up a flight of stairs felt differently. And I thought, oh, that's weird. I never breathe differently when I go up a flight of stairs. You know, I yeah. usually can jog upstairs. You know, and do things like that. Do stairs as an exercise, but just little things like that. Um, because it was breast cancer, I felt like my cleavage had changed just a little bit. And I thought, well, that's different. And I thought, well, maybe it's age-related. But no, I'm pretty fit. So, But it was all those things. It was all those things. But they were just micro. Wow. Yeah. They were micro, little micro things. So it really taught me to pay attention to the little tiny signals that my body gives me. And now I'm I'm more aware from like the moment I wake up to the moment I lay my head down at night. It's like, well, how how does my body feel? I check in. I check in throughout the day. Like, okay. Is my body telling me anything that I should pay mm-hmm. attention to? And I don't mean like, oh, my God, I'm scared. Oh, God, is that no, cancer? No, 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 never like that. But it's like, oh, okay, that made, you know, maybe – Maybe eating something with soy, it's like, oh, with some people, it's like, oh, it makes your hands swell a little better. You know, sometimes we're so caught up in what we have to do next that people gobble down food or they race through traffic or they, you know, when really your body's like, uh, you haven't taken a deep breath in about five hours, you know, instead of like, okay, I'm at a stoplight, so here's a good time to breathe deeply. Inhale, exhale, you know, ten times. Move on, you know. Yes. Those little well, things okay. that calm the body down. And meditation, you know, is a big part of my my daily life. And that's... Well, folks, uh, key to this whole thing, and for those we might be born, I don't care, we're being educational for a moment here, which, <laughs> is, a on, which is a shocker on this show, but, you know, we're going to be educational for a second when we can. Yeah. 
the key part is pay attention to yourselves, both physically, mentally. You know, just be more self-aware, I guess, what the <laughs> words will be. Yeah, and there's so many distractions in life, right? So it's yeah, easy exactly. to not do that. Um, or sometimes people think they're being selfish, like, oh, I'm fine. You know, I've got kids. I've got a job. You know, it's like, well, you yeah. don't have any of those things if you don't have your ability to have your health and move around and breathe deep. And, yeah. and it's just tiny things. I mean, it, I'm not, that, I think it's all uplifting. You know, it's all good to yeah. know. It's better to know than not. Like I said, anyway, take a moment to check in with yourself once in a while, folks. It it don't it won't kill you. It might actually save your life. Go figure. It certainly will. Yeah. So uh, on a more uh, positive note, uh, your recent record album, digital download, however you may, folks may get music, uh, you had a release uh, last year. The Roots of Ray. Yeah, uh, how The would Roots you, of Ray. Yes, how would you describe the title, Roots of Ray? What, like, where did you come up with that? And that, how does that incorporate with the theme of the music from this? Well, uh, I've written pop songs for over a decade. I've Well, I've written them for a long time, but I've had a lot of success with them over the last decade and but a big part of it was my uh connection to incorporating my my roots and my training in jazz and my love for jazz and taking that and incorporating that into a pop writing pop songwriting style you know some people do it with country some people do it with, you know, rock and or R&B. And with me, it always kind of fell back on my jazz, uh, love for jazz and making a living as a jazz musician. And so the album name is just going back to my roots as a jazz musician and a Latin jazz musician. You know, I have Latin roots. And so... I wanted to take American songs and some songs in Spanish and give them all a Latin jazz arrangement. And so I did that by partnering with a dear friend of mine who we had worked together in a live setting many times, but never in the recording studio. He's a multi-Grammy winning, highly acclaimed Latin jazz composer, pianist, arranger. His name's Oscar Hernandez. And... Um, we, you know, we started, we got together. The whole project took less than six months because we just knew exactly what we wanted and worked really well and really quickly together. And we recorded the album live in a studio and not live before a studio audience. I mean, like yeah, I know all musicians mean, in the room. Sure. Yeah, some people don't know. But, you know, and then, um, and so that's, you know, kind of the element of the way jazz should be. And so that's why it's called The Roots of Ray, going back to my roots as a Latin jazz musician. And also well, singing deeply, going back into my roots as singing in English and Spanish. And I find that the album is a it's a new American and Latin American songbook for a new America, you know. The United States the United States looks very differently now than it did when the Great American Songbook was out in the twenties, you know. So yes. That's, yeah, I want to that's where it comes from. from. Makes sense perfectly. Well, I want to throw this out there before I throw to the two songs I'm going to throw to, which obviously Margo was kind enough to send over from this album. Uh, you mentioned something there in that previous answer there, that you did this live with music and the performers in studio. Yeah. And most people may or may not realize as far as when artists record music nowadays, a lot of times they might record the vocal tracks in a home studio or this or that. Or they, they might not be with the musicians at the time. Uh, can you explain the feeling of actually being there with a band as compared to just going based off the music? 
Well, to describe the feeling is that I feel that it, music is an organic thing. It's an organism. It's like a living organism. And it's a conversation that you're having with the musicians. Uh, each instrument is kind of speaking to each other and, and with each other. And, and everybody is uh, participating in this musical conversation, including the vocals. I see my vocals as another instrument not just yes. someone who's telling the story. And so one of my favorite things to do is perform it live because every time I perform a song, it's it's different every time because there's an interaction with the audience, there's an interaction with my musicians, there's a feeling on stage and the, the heat and the, and the vibration in the room and the excitement. And so um, a lot of albums today aren't recorded that way at all a lot of musicians aren't even used they're using you know software and programmed drums and keyboards and things like that and that's that's all good and well but uh this kind of music is not typically to be performed or recorded that way it's all about living in the moment and the excitement of it and so we went into the studio everybody is in their own isolation Space, but we can all see each other, and I am singing live in the right next to the engineer with a handheld mic, and so therefore I am performing live at that moment so that I can direct the band live, and Oscar is on the piano and he's also signaling the band for all of the you know arrangements that we had crafted, but um, or he had crafted, uh, so. Everything we only do like two takes, and that's it. Two takes, you know, one one to one that says, "Yeah, we did it well," and the other one's a safety. It's always called a safety take. And then I'm singing, and then but because the quality of the vocals are in the engineering room, which is not the room where I plan to actually get the best quality vocals, and I mean sound quality around me because it's picking up ambient sounds. Uh, that's what what you call a scratch vocal, but it is still live, and that's what the band is feeding off of is my vocal. And then we pick the take we like, and then I go in and record my vocals on top of that. Part of the reason why I did a scratch vocal in addition to recording the band live is because I'm also directing the session. So right then and there, as I'm giving a live performance, I'm also, I also have my producer hat on, and so I'm directing the recording session alongside with Oscar directing the band. And so I want to give my vocals undivided attention, and so therefore um, I go back after the, everybody's gone home, and Oscar and the engineer and I stay. Um, maybe it's a day later. I've listened to the tracks, and then I go in and record my songs. And it is actually, yeah, and it's it's really beneficial. And the minute I step behind the walls of this of the isolation booth where I'm singing my vocals, I am a performer. I'm a singer. But the minute it's it's an interesting transition how I can compartmentalize my brain that way. I don't know if anybody else can. I I think a lot of people do. Um, you know, the minute I I leave the booth and I say, well, I need to hear it, but I need to hear it in there. I leave the booth, I walk through the hallway, I go through the two double doors, and I go back into the mixing room where the mixing board and the engineer are, and I am not that performer anymore. Now I'm a producer, and now I'm listening with producer ears, as if I'm listening to a singer who's like a totally, a person totally different from me. And so now I have these like discerning ears like no, okay, we need okay, I like that take, but I feel like the emotion could be this. Let me give you one more take. But I also don't want to beat it to death too. I yeah. I, I want to sing it as fresh as possible, get the emotion out that I want for that song and then move on. And exactly. I also I also spaced out the songs. I I wanted to do you know, a certain set of songs one day and then another set of songs another day just based on my emotion and what I'm bringing to it. And not a lot of people have that luxury. I, I would be totally fine to sing it all in one day. 
I just also want to, um, you know, I just love being in the studio, quite honestly. I think that's really why I spaced it out. But yeah, if, if I if I needed to record my vocals in one day, I would certainly do it. God knows I've sung for hours in a day giving full concerts, so that's fine. I love doing that. And, you know, the pressure, it's another kind of added, I wouldn't say pressure because that makes it sound like it's bad, but it's like the excitement of giving that kind of performance. You know, you don't get any do-overs. Yeah. But, hey, that's why you're in the recording studio, so that you can hear it back, and then you can give the world your best take. But I so, also don't like to beat things to death, you know. Yeah, so right now we're going to go back to back, and obviously, like I said, Thank you. Ms. Ray was wonderful enough to send them over. We're going to give you a little taste now of both Angel Eyes and When Lows of Your Mind. Oh. Uh, then we'll, yeah, we'll, that's cool with you to throw a little, little bit in, you know, wet people's appetite there. Great. I did. I 
good, Dad. So what's it like working with somebody as talented as John? And I'm not knocking uh, Dal, because I love Dal's work as well, but you've got the hands-on experience right with John. Ah, uh, well... I've been writing with him for several years now. It's actually almost 10 years. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to call him and tell him that. It's going to be like, wow, do you know how long we've known each other? Uh, you know, he is one of the most generous songwriters. He's very open to collaboration. He uh, is very grounding when you work with him. Of course, the first time... I was going to work with him. I was totally over the moon and a little like, wow, I'm so excited. I can barely sit still. Um, but we ended up writing our first hit together on that day uh, called Let the Rain. In my shoes, nothing to I'm all ears when I write with him because he has such a honed craft on how to put pieces of a song together. And I can honestly say we work we work very fast. Um, we work well together. We only need like a couple of hours to just have fun, eat something, and and put a song together. And I'm not saying like, oh, it's great because we do it fast. It's just we're very focused, and therefore I think that's why we come away with something. Um, we wrote a song called Never Too Late, and it was the first time that that uh, we had written the lyrics together because usually I had come to him with my melody and my lyrics, and, and then together we finished out a song, uh, whereas with Never Too Late, we wrote it together at the same time, you know, yeah. and it all, all the elements came together. And that actually was two right songwriting sessions. We had, the original title was called Happy. And, uh, and I thought, oh, we need to finish out these lyrics. And then he met me again in Vegas. So we were in Aspen when we wrote, uh, what was called Happy. And then, uh, he met me again in Vegas and we finished the, the lyrics together sitting in the hotel room. And uh, turned it into Never Too Late, which I, I like that title much better. Because yes. it's never too well, late to be kind to each other and be happy. <laughs> well, we will tease a little of that as well. And obviously, go to the same outlets to check out her other music and songs and whatnot. Talk intoxicated like love junkies do. Waiting for the bell to sound Cause I can't go another round All of the moments that we left undone And the words that we should have said It's now or too late to be kind to each other and be happy It's now or too late Before I wrap up, and luckily you were super cool because, you know, as I explained in the emails back and forth with you last night, yeah. I want to make sure I keep that fine line. And I didn't even, I, excuse me, I didn't even realize this until I started doing the research and we had this date locked in. Yeah. Uh, you you were actually no longer married to Mr. Ron Waite, who most people know as the comedian and such from Blue Collar, but what, and I guess the best way to ask this question is, what actually happened in, so, so saying. Oh, well, um, let's see, I met Ron White when I was 18 years old, so it was a long time ago, 
Yes. He is, uh, I was in a can rock I pre- band. Can something with that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, and he still, I believe, still does stuff uh, with him. Your brother, Alex Romando, is a yes. fellow comedian as well. Yes. And hence, they've worked together. And Go ahead. Yes. Um, so, basically, I had an all-female rock band, which was very badass, by the way. And <laughs> we wrote all of our songs. Um, it was my first, you know, band and uh, that that I fronted uh, or just was in. I was studying classically uh, in school. And so my brother started managing a comedy club in Arlington, Texas. And, and we would go down there to watch all the comedians and watch open mic night, which my brother very quickly became one of those open micers. And Ron... White would go up there as well. He was just starting out in comedy. And uh, and then one day, my brother said to Ron, they actually met the first time Ron ever did three minutes of comedy. Uh, Ron walked into the Funny Bone Comedy Club, and he was nervous, so he went straight to the bar and ordered a beer and a shot of tequila, and my brother handed him that beer and shot of tequila. And then um, they started to do comedy about six months apart from each other, and and in that time, uh, my brother said, would you like to see my little sister's all-girl band? And Ron said, no. <laughs> no, I don't want to see your little sister's, you know, bubblegum band. And he's like, okay, don't be a jerk. They're actually really good. And I'm sure he didn't use the word jerk, but <laughs> I'm sure he yeah. used something more profane. And so uh, <laughs> he and a bunch of people from the comedy club go to see uh, us perform. I don't remember meeting him that night. That's the first night he saw me. And um, and the way Ron tells it is Margo's uh, on her knees in a little leather miniskirt belting out a, a rock song with a voice I couldn't even imagine. And I thought that's the sexiest thing I've ever seen. And here's how I operate. Once I see something I like, 20 years later, I ask her brother for her phone number. <laughs> so then that's kind of how it worked out, you know. And so I had known him a, a very, very long time. And he was peripherally in my family as a friend. And anyway, right after my father died, we got together in 2007. Uh, he gave me my wedding ring in 2009. And we've been together ever since. And, you know, it just didn't work out. It was his third marriage, my first. And it's um, it's not over yet, and it's in the press that he's denying that we were ever married, which is yeah, kind I've of absurd. It's kind of absurd. You can anybody can go to ronandmargo.com and watch the official wedding ceremony. And you know, we got married in Texas. You don't need a wedding license, marriage license, to get married in Texas. And 300 people, the press, the media, worldwide, whatever. So it's okay. It's it's sad when people break up, but it shouldn't take a village to break up. But yeah. that's Ron wants me to prove in court that that we're married, and that's kind of sad. So yeah, we're at the day. end. I think we're at the end of it, and uh, you know, maybe one day it'll all be amicable. Yeah, and that's uh, the I end of the day. That's all we hope for. Yeah, I certainly want to live my life that way, and not leave yeah. any scorched earth. With anyone, and goes so, back to what we were talking about in the beginning, as far as toxic, yeah, in different ways, and circles all around here. So, yeah, well, I, I know my truth, and um, and I would never hurt anyone in the process of just trying to get something as simple as a divorce. <laughs> but yeah. apparently, um. That's not always up to just me, so that's okay. Yeah. Trying to get through it as pain, painlessly as possible. Yes. And it's been going on for two years, and it'll be over soon. So that's all yeah. I can say. Can you but thanks you for a little bit. Don't know him. I wasn't there. I can't. I'm not going to sit here and judge. I don't know. So not my well, place to. That's. A, I mean, hey, it's just divorce is painful anyway. So it, it's okay. yeah, it's, everybody's got their yeah, story. We know and, that's, yeah. yeah, we know how that goes. So yeah, end of the 
day, we hope everything goes as smooth and as amicable as possible. <laughs> I do, too. I do, too. I really yeah, do. But I want to end this on a good note again and yeah. go back and reference the music. Yes. Google it up, Margot Ray, R-E-Y, as she said. <laughs> Find the roots of Ray. That yeah. Ray is a not Ray Romano, R A Y. R E Y. Yes, as a Find her. She's all over social media. She's over MargoRay.com. She's got tours. she got. Come get. If, you, if you're to get the music on CD and whatnot, or however you want to get. Hell, I'm sure we can find it on vinyl. She'll sign it for you. Get yourself a. Get the music, folks. Margo. Thank you yes. so much. And thank you so much for having me, and thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, reach out to me. I'm easy to find. Uh, you can find me at uh, VIP at MargoRay.com and become uh, a flower in the Margot Ray garden. I will reach out to you. Hey y'all, it's Billy Joe and you're listening to Crazy Train Radio.